So, dear Dan, uh, thank you very much for accepting my interview request my here in the Groningen Museum and congratulations with your awesome solo exhibition here, also in the Groningen Museum. Um, you are an architect, an artist, a poet, a designer, an innovator, even a sound artist, I would like to say. Also a philosopher, I think, and an educator for sure, and a colleague, a friend, and for sure a professional human being. Hallelujah. You were born in Newcorp, that's in the area of Enschede in Holland, in the Netherlands. Yeah. And you studied at the Aki Enschede, that's the Academy for Art and Industry. Uh, and after that you studied at the Berlage Institute uh, in Rotterdam, uh, which is part of the Technical University in Delft. Mm -hmm. um, and there you studied architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and since 2007 you have your own studio in Rotterdam and in Shanghai. Well, can you tell me how you did discover in your life you would become a professional artist and designer? Uh, well, I think I've always created things to make sense of the world around me. Uh, maybe it's my way of um, trying to make the world more understandable and more, you know, feel more connected with it. Um, you look outside your window, you see traffic jams, air pollution. Um, very confusing in that way. And, and, and yeah, so what can I do to improve that? for myself, but also for the people around me. Um, I think it starts there, yeah. So it's inspiration, but it's also irritation. Yeah, they go hand in hand. So there was nothing uh, spe specific that happened maybe uh, in your uh, period when you were younger that you thought, hmm, I think I will go that way and not become a baker. Well, I, I always like making things, using technology, thinking about spaces or architecture. Um, that was really important to me. The notion of, of creating okay. spaces or places. Yeah. And what did you learn during your studies the most? What you still, what is still important for you today, in work and aesthetics? Well, the fact that you can have an impact and that you can activate yourself and people around you um, to trigger a sort of curiosity towards how the world can look like. And so it's not, um, it's not static, uh, but you are a part of it. And I think. Uh, yeah, that's really powerful, yeah. And I think the more focus we put on that, you change from consumer uh, to, to, to maker. Yeah, that's the, you make decisions, you make dreams, and it starts there. Yeah. Okay, and did you have important mentors in that period? Uh, what did they maybe give to you, specific? Well, I studied fine art, architecture, a lot of smart people there, and, uh, uh, and you learn, of course, by, by we're working with a team of designers, engineers, so many 50 million little mini decisions that you're making in order to uh, yeah, make these kind of projects happen. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing amount of time you spent on it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you work uh, so far really special and absolutely fascinating the way how you create and what, what comes out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, like you created the Smog Free Tower, yeah. which is located in Rotterdam and Shanghai, uh, and also on other places Different in China. Places, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and other uh, very interesting uh, projects like the Icon Afslar Dijk, mm -hmm. yeah. um, the project Beyond, the Van Gogh uh, Rose Guard bike trail, also very interesting, and al also other uh, uh, projects like the liquid space or intimacy and presence, of course, which mm -hmm. is the project here in Groningen. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to share a general message in your work? And what do all your work have in common? They trigger imagination and they trigger, I think, uh, a connection between yourself and the world around you. And sometimes they're more practical, they give you clean air or they try to fix space waste. And sometimes they're more yeah, poetic or different poetic, um, showing the rising sea level, um, create a notion of wonder. It really depends on the conversation you're having um, with the other people uh, on the phase you're in that life. You know, it's, it's a dialogue. Yeah, it's a journey. You don't know where it's heading towards, the, but it always leads to very concrete, solid experiences that, that, that large groups of people can plug into. And I look at the people, I don't look at the work anymore. Or maybe the, the people already work in that way. And that, uh, yeah, that makes it fun also to be here and, and walk around and, and look and observe yeah, and learn. And learn, yes. 
Well, very special for me was uh, to be invited uh, to the press mm. meeting yesterday here in the Groningen Museum. And when you arrived, uh, you shake hands with every single journalist in the room, which was very special for me and mm. absolutely uncommon so really? far. I, oh. I'm here. Okay. Please explain your behavior. Why did you do that? I don't have to explain it. It's just common decent. You're having a conversation, so you say hello. I think that's, that starts there, you know? It's a dialogue. I'm not just there and you write it down. It's, we're not bowling, we're ping-ponging. So the minimal I can do is look you in the eyes and try to remember your name and at least remember you. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, it starts there. I don't know. Yeah, it seemed like a natural thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Which for me was very special because it is still special because it left something like a mark in me, you know? That, mm -hmm. that you're not somewhere upstairs you are on the same level, you know, somehow, of course. like me. Oh, it's all planet and, Earth. Uh, We're all Earthlings. Yes. Well, that is. <laughs> this is it, man. We got to, This is what we had to work with. This is still, <laughs> still very special. <laughs> this is especially it. in museum. Oh, but it's good. Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I'm, I'm glad you um, you picked it up. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. You can you can talk, but you can also do. And, uh, there, yeah. It, maybe that 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 create differences between people. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, you often work with the term social technology. Uh, what is your idea? Can you please explain that? Well, I think there's not a lack of technology, but maybe a lack of imagination, how we want that future world to look like. And uh, maybe my job as a maker, as a creator, is to show what is possible. Uh, so tech is a great tool, but if it's disconnected from dreams or vision, we just become robot food. Um, that's not what we want. So you have, a, you have a George Orwell scenario where we're dominated and we have Leonardo da Vinci scenario where we're um, enhanced. And, uh, yeah, I would love to focus on, on the second one. Yeah. But how can we create our technology? I mean, today we are all slaves of companies and industries. And I guess if we could organize clean air, we would. But can we? Of course we can. Um, it's just a question of making a decision, and making a plan and sticking to it. We're now with Rabobank, one of the largest banks in the Netherlands, calculating what is the price of clean air for everybody in the Netherlands. So how much does it cost to you know, get rid of the coil and invest in green? And I'm really curious to the result. Will it be one euro? Will it be five euros? Will it be less than my Netflix monthly account, 10 euros? What's the price of clean air? And I think just to ask that question, slightly poetic, and then giving a very concrete answer, and maybe that, that, that's... And then, of course, you have different ways of getting green energy or clean air. Um, so I think I've always been using sort of this bottom-up approach, eh? doing something and then showing that it can be done. But it's also interesting to look from top-down and make a big statement and then show it's possible. Um, yeah, it's an experiment. Yeah. Well, that's a very interesting idea uh, that you want to generate technology for everyone and that also comes from everyone. Yeah, and I think technology is our language. So the moment we don't see it as something technological, but as a language, our way we communicate, we, we create, we will also be less eager to hand it over to somebody else. Yes, uh, so if we realize it is our ABC and the moment we hand it to one party who puts a fence around it, we're limiting our way of expressing and, and, and getting to know ourselves and each other. And we should never allow that. So I think social media has been great and you know, a lot of things I've, I've, I've learned from it. Um, but if it's too curated and too much dominated by rules that I A, don't know, B, don't understand, and C, have no influence in, we're, we're getting into a weird situation. But fortunately, you know, people are not stupid. And they see it, they react. You know, it's always sort of like a push and pull. Yeah, that, 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 that's human, that makes societies, yeah. Yeah. Well, here in, the, in Groningen, the museum, you have a, a solo uh, exhibition uh, with the title Presence. Uh, can you please tell me a little bit about the process, to uh, what uh, mm. made you feel to, to, did, to do what you did yeah, here? So and uh, also, are you happy with the result? So Groningen Museum contacted me a couple of years ago to do an exhibition in uh, it horrified me the idea of putting old, previous realized work with science, please do not touch. Um, so we made a new proposal, a dream landscape, where your presence, you as a visitor, you as a human being, 
would be part of the work, would actually create the work, and the work would create you. Um, one layer of light emittingness and different rooms activate that layer in a different way, from grids to stardust to spheres to um, yeah, sort of drawing robots. And um, you can walk around and just look at it and think, okay, whatever, uh, or beautiful. But the moment you start to interact with it, that's when you get the sweet spot. That's the, when the magic can in. And so what I've seen is from a distance how people interact and it's beautiful. And I think in a weird way, there's a risk that they don't, that they miss it, but that also when they get it, it's, that makes it so beautiful because it changes their perception. Like, oh, wow, I'm doing this. It's me. Um, so I think it's, it's working really well. And um, of course, we're still tweaking and tuning and we will be doing that as the show sort of grows. But um, yeah, it, it's very intimate. And I think that's, that's really beautiful to see. So you're, you're happy with the result? Oh, I'm never happy with the result. I'm always wandering around. I'm having my little list of 10 things we can do better. So that's the, the call and the conversation I'm, uh, I'm having now. I mean, you're always sort of polishing and it's always protopia, never finished. Um, but yeah, that's in my nature. Okay, well, the last room in this exhibition uh, is filled just with a message. And it's the message of uh, Marshall McLuhan. Yes, it is. Uh, that we are not only passengers on this planet, on Earth, we are the crew. Um, explain your idea of this empty room somehow. Well, it's the room where you show the meta layer. Um, that the interactions and the, yeah, the, the connection that you felt is somehow the most important to solve these challenges that we're facing. It's not a technological challenge or a money challenge. It's a question of, do I feel connected? And the moment I feel connected, I have a, an urgency to make it better, smarter, more beautiful. And maybe the fact that we feel disconnected is one of the biggest hurdles uh, for humanity. Yeah? Like, oh, a dying polar bear, yeah, okay, whatever. I, I don't even know how a polar bear looks like. Or like in real, I've never seen one. Or plastic in the ocean, yeah, okay, well, I'm in a city. So it, it, it's so big that it makes it abstract. So we need to make it small and we need to make it personal. Okay. Well, you work and live next to Rotterdam, also in Shanghai. Uh, what does Shanghai offer you uh, next to maybe food, people, architecture, uh, mind settings? Yeah. Uh, are you different there and in which way? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I love China. I love Asia. I feel... When I do projects here in Europe, they usually ask me, are you sure you've done it before, risk management? And in, in Asia and Middle East, they usually ask me, are you sure this is the first time? Because they want to be first. Groningen Museum is an exception, actually, yeah, where we are in our mind now. Um, so they challenge me, and, and I don't have to uh, reduce myself. Here in Europe, you always, if you're too bold, if you're too radical, I do, do me normal, do, act normal. And um, I want to be normal, but I think also we should be ourselves to the maximum version. And um, so in these kind of countries, they challenge me, they push me. Uh, the beauty of Europe is that there's a great history, there's culture, there are smart people, there is an equalness in society. Um, so I think Europe is great to research and experiment, and Asia and China is sort of China and um, of Asia and Middle East is great to sort of really make it grow, make it big. So by sort of going back and forward, they they trigger the introvert and the extrovert part of my, my brain, my being, and and that that keeps me balanced. Yeah. If I only do Dubai, get a car, and have uh, only stay in Netherlands, I, I I become too much a pancake, too 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 too, too flat. Yeah. But that means that that you're really different there than here. Somehow. Well, it's all me. It's just a different side of. It triggers a different side in me. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, so I, I think it's good to trigger diversity within yourself. It doesn't really matter what kind of, as long as you're triggered in in a different way. Yeah, yeah. You feel that and you react to that and you you, you learn from that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, you have, I assume, a strong desire to create. Uh, where does this come from, and what is it? No idea. It's just you wake up one morning and you have an idea. And basically that sort of sucks because you need to get it out of there and it's like you're this voluntary prisoner of your own imagination and uh, 
you're like, oh boy, that's going to be another two years of my life. And we have people saying it's not possible or it's not allowed or it cannot be done or it should have been done before. Or... But yeah, you surrender to the idea and the, the idea guides you and the idea shapes you and you listen to the idea and then you start to fulfill the idea and manifest the idea. And, um, and then suddenly it's for everybody again, like today, the opening. And voila, I'm out of control. I can tweak a bit, but in a way I'm out of control. And um, that's sort of scary and beautiful at the same time. So, so uh, I make things, but, but the making makes me as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, you are very successful, I can say that, I think. Uh, you work a lot, uh, you, you have many exhibitions uh, everywhere, you are involved in many projects, uh, and you are embraced all over the world with your projects. How does this feel for you? And does this generate in you more possibilities, maybe? Are you grateful for that? Yeah, I don't really feel it. I, I, I'm so focused on what is there to come, and I'm so focused on how to make it better. So I don't really feel that that much, so to speak, or maybe, maybe that's just my mentality. Um, I enjoy it, and, and I'm grateful. Um, but when I receive an award, there's three minutes of joy, and then it's more like, okay, so what I'm gonna do with it? Or what's next? Or, you know, so it's sort of a, a joy, and it's also an activator, in a way. And um, yeah, that's something I do to myself. But I think that pushes the quality of the projects, that pushes the team, that pushes myself. So there are these little moments where you just walk around and you see people interact, and they, in a way they get it, or they own it, or they personalize it. I think that, that, that's, that's the best part. But most of the time you're just sort of uh, in a room, alone, trying to figure out how to make ideas happen. Um, it's also uncomfortable. Uh, it's tweaking, it's tuning, it's failing. Um, so it's, it's less glamorous and less controlled than one maybe can imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's good, that's fine. I'm okay with that. Yeah. yeah. Well, can you tell me how you create uh, or how do you compose your work? Uh, do you follow a ritual for starting something? Uh, and do you always start with nothing when you really start? Nothing like, nothing more than a white piece of paper. Is that possible? And how do you decide what is good and what not? Um, I think it's always a conversation, a dialogue with yourself, a frustration and irritation, a request from a museum or a client something you see on your way to whatever that sticks and then you internalize it and then you wonder how to improve and it just goes through your brain for a long time and then suddenly it pops up. And so you're like a sponge, you suck it all up and then you digest and you put it out there again. Um, what else, what was the question? Well, uh, how, how do you create? Is there a ritual? Oh, is there a ritual? Maybe. Um, Do you need something specific uh, to start? Well, I love my laptop. Um, I love having a, a small group of people that I trust around me, which I can ping pong with. Um, I love the studio, big space with a lot of light. I can prototype, um, sketch. Uh, but I also like this, sort of like, like I go to a place and I'm there for two or three weeks. And make something and then I unplug and then tomorrow I go somewhere else for two three weeks and I, so you sort of plug in, you create and then you plug out and you come back and you keep in contact but you sort of, yeah, you really try to blend in and become one with what you're doing, yeah, that's really important. Okay, that sounds interesting. Did you also create something new here in Groningen? Until, mm. Did you create something here in Groningen? What do you mean? The time you are here in Groningen, did you also create something here. Oh man, we've been working for three weeks non-stop because the prototypes we had were sort of working but small scale and then you build it up and it's completely different. Different feeling. In the beginning it, it was very clunky, very technological and then we just worked our ass off to make it poetic and suddenly it popped up. But, um, no, 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 I mean this was show was made here. I mean we had two years of preparation but it was created here. Yeah, with 12 people in a dark room. Tuning, yeah. Okay. 
well, do you have uh, a state in your life, like a reality where nothing is, where no images are, no ideas, no desire to create, no conditions, just pure being, maybe in silence? Do you have something like that? Yeah, I go night diving in tropical Asia. Um, you move your hand through the water, um, there are fishes, but they don't listen to you, and they shouldn't. Uh, so it's a world where you are a visitor. Um, where you observe, uh, where you surrender, and it's magical, you know, like the light emitting algae or the, the stingrays, um, weird coral reefs which has the same shape as my brain, but how do they know that? Um, I think that, that I have to control my breathing in order to, you know, let them come to me. Um, in a way, it's sort of like a 4D yoga. If I'm too excited, they just disappear. So. It's amazing, and you're in this world, it's amazing. Um, so I love the diving. It took me a long time to figure out that this is my thing, uh, but especially at night, it's so mysterious. Yeah, beautiful. Well, well you work with technologies from today, uh, and we are even transforming from analog to digital mm -hmm. in a very fast uh, way, but we still have an ancient body with an ancient soul somehow. So how does this work together? What do you think? Well, I think when you look at your body, it's amazing. I mean, the amount of sensors I have on, on the top of my finger, it's, I mean, no computer can compete with that. So I think we're completely underestimating the capacity we have in our brain and our body, uh, the signals it gives, uh, the things we can learn, the capacity we have. I was thinking about this story that there was this world record of running 3 minute 20. Everybody said it was impossible to run faster. Human body would not be allowed to do it or capable of doing it. And then one guy walked into the room and he didn't know that. And he ran 3 minutes. Beat the record. But within 4 weeks, 3 other people came. And they also ran 3 minutes. So what changed? The body? No. The track? No. The mind. And the mind brought them to a place of which they didn't know it exists. So the mind is really powerful in pushing ourselves. Um, that's the capacity we need to have, we need to train to deal with these global challenges. It's not about doing it 5% less worse. <laughs> it's, not innovation. it's not also a very pleasant way of, yeah, okay, we're going to do it 5% less worse this week. That's not very, you know, like exciting, like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's, let's do that. Um, it's something new and we have to go and explore that. Yeah. Yeah, well, even we are uh, changing so fast uh, with all these technologies. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's not a coincidence that people more and more feel lost in this uh, society. They feel depressed, ignored, yeah. lonely, really lonely in this society. What do you think is going wrong? I think we're confused. I think we're disconnected. I think uh, yeah, creating a world which is not real and, um, and uh, that's complicated and uh, it's changing and we're not. Uh, so, uh, so, so we need to focus on the, on the on the values that we as humans are really good at: creativity, questioning, creating. And the moment we try to become a robot and just improve slightly or accept, I think then it goes wrong. So are we becoming more machine or more, more human? Um, and is technology helping us to become more human or are we just becoming robot food? I think that, that's, kind of, that's the discussion we need to have. And um, It's weird that we accept air pollution. It's weird that we accept traffic jams and Ant Hill doesn't have a traffic jam. You know, how do they do that? Communication. They communicate. So what can we learn from nature to make our city more livable? Um, and how can we create a, a place where we can invest commitment, money, time, where there's space for failure? Yeah. Everybody says, oh yeah, failure is really good. No, if you fail, it's not good. And they're gonna... So how can you create a place where that's sort of allowed? Um, these are the things we should focus on. And yeah. When you look at a city like Shenzhen, or you know, maybe in a weird way, Singapore and Dubai, these places, they challenge you in that way and allow you to experiment and allow you to... Is it perfect? No, but 
there is sort of intrinsic curiosity towards that. Yeah, that's beautiful. I feel connected there. Yeah. Shall we well, do one or two more questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, can you please explain me the work in Timothy White from 2010? Uh, your view on being vulnerable and showing feelings and intimacy. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's it's funny that you ask that question. Uh, it's a beautiful project where we uh, like like technology as a second skin, and then how can we create intimacy in this hyper technological world? So, to make garments which change in transparency, uh, connected how you feel. Um, show that fashion is not just something with a logo on it, but um, yeah, it should be an extension of who you are. And when you look at the presence, in a way, it's also this skin on the floor being activated in different rooms by the people, by the light, um, sort of like a layer, you know, like, a, like, a, like an infiltrator. <laughs> um, so I think we, we, we sort of not focused on the fashion so much anymore, but there's no, or, or the gates of light, it's also that sort of coat, sort of jacket around the buildings. We learned a lot from, from the fashion project, but now more on an on a architectural scale, yeah. Okay, uh, can you tell me what is the most magically for you to be in this life today, for you? What do you love about your life? Uh, well, I, I love that I have an idea and I find a way how to make it happen. Yeah, and I have like all these people saying it's not possible or not allowed and then you find a way to do it and, uh, and then they say oh you should have done that before yeah. and then you start again and again and again so I, lo I love that I have a, a place, a system, a trust um, where I can create and that's really powerful and not so many people have that that's really valuable and of course there's criticism and debate and that's part of it you know but um, with the idea that what you add to the world somehow improves it and that's a very subjective notion, of course, yeah, because you can do good and bad with it. Um, but I like that I'm part of that change in my own way. And it's still me, you know, I know. I can, yeah, it's, it's still me. Yeah. And what is your advice for young creators, for students? Um, you can be driven by fear or curiosity. Yeah? I mean, these are the, the angel and the devil on your shoulder. And um, that's a choice. So. Of course, I'm scared. It's scary. You work. It's, you're, it's scary. It's scary. But you can also be curious. What if it fails? What if it works? <laughs> so what you can do is decide on which you base your decision on fear or curiosity. And I would highly recommend it to base it on curiosity. It's a very good motivator. Fear not so much. So um, don't be scared. Invest in your ideas. Let the idea guide you. And you're gonna bump to a bit, but that's part of it. Yeah. Okay. Thank cool. you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Good questions.